live. Hello, everybody. Hi, my name is Paul Bass. I am a homeschool parent. My children have taken Carol's courses, but I'm also a student of Professor Carol, and I've had the joy and the pleasure of working with her and her husband, Hank, for a few years now, and I continue to be excited about the different products that they bring out for, uh, not just for homeschoolers, but to bring us closer to the arts and history. And today we're talking about cultivating beauty. And Professor Carol, yes, you're on, thank you. I am on, I'm looking down at my notes, which you know, sometimes I don't even use, but I know, I like to know where they are. Well, welcome back everyone. If you were here uh, for our first session, which I directed more at the K through for second, third, even PK, I was talking, starting really right at the beginning um, of something that is gonna cross all types of music, which is the five elements of music generally the way we begin any kind of a college theory class, high school theory class, even smaller, uh, younger theory class, um, because these are the elements that cross into virtually any kind of music in the world, other cultures as well as our Western culture. And they are, to remind you, melody, and of course that style can vary from country to country, culture to culture, time, uh, depending on the popular styles of the time, so melody, Harmony, the kinds of chords that we, we talked through quite a bit in the first session. Then rhythm or pulse, which of course has many, many applications. We start talking about more sophisticated uses of it. And we ended the session talking a little bit about how some, some configurations of pulse or meter or rhythm lend themselves to different kinds of patterns. And we can do a lot more with that in the future as well. Then we have two terms that you may not be used to using as much as melody, harmony, and rhythm. And that would be texture, that idea of the musical lines coming together, which we explored thinking about choral music and orchestral music, where all the different instruments have their own uh, individual lines. And also simple things like singing around, like row, row, row your boat or Frere Jaca, that that's an experiment with texture that we almost all do as little ones. And then we stop doing it. You know, we could keep exploring that in our ears and do many, many more sophisticated versions of it, but we all tend to get shut down musically when we're little. Um, and the, let me say the, the last element, and then I'll return to that point. That last element was timbre, the, the quality of sound created by the science of acoustics, the physics of musical sound, the physics of any sound. So I even talked about things I like, such as bells, and we had different kind of bells. I didn't show you that one last time. I showed you this one. And I had other bells. I had an old school bell from probably late 19th century. And, and so again, sound, whether it's a two-year-old, four-year-old banging on the table, on the pots, on the furniture, listening, you know, we don't want to encourage too much banging. But the fact is they're not just wanting to hit something. They are interested, especially when they're little, in the sound that comes out. So again, melody, harmony, rhythm, texture or thickness or thinness of the voices that are the melodies that you're hearing and timbre t-i-m-b-r-e using the french term it sounds like as if it's spelled differently because that's french for you right oh boy french spelling but t-i-m-b-r-e timbre okay so those were those uh elements that are basic and then i spoke a little bit about form um, and of course the fact that some music has words or texts and there were lyrics, as we tend to say, words, lyrics, text. So those are two added ingredients that can be there. Form is repetition and contrast. And as we develop this series on cultivating beauty, I'll be talking more and more about form. And Paul, you will probably remember that in the um, um, courses in Discovering Music, which I know you know, we talked a lot about musical forms, types of music, uh, concertos and, and rondos and the, yeah, I mean, do you, did some of that strike you at the time, giving you labels for things you were already hearing? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It gives, gives us a tremendous perspective and it, it takes us further. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, well, and, and our ears hear repetition and contrast. We hear repetition and contrast. And the more vivid the composer makes it, the more clear the form. I use the example of, I did Blessed Assurance, where you have the verse and then you have the refrain. That is, of course, a two-part form that we're very familiar with in hymns. And we'll do more with this. 
Now, moving along, though, I don't want to spend time all the time reviewing because I want to take it a little further. Basically, what we do as our kids get older is we take the things that they've they've experimented with and joy, had joyful encounters with sound and, and um, all the, the discoveries and the discovery of their own voices. And we want to move it into a more, you could say age appropriate, more sophisticated, more in, engaging, inviting, um, alluring, challenging, whatever you like to use, something that keeps their attention. Because at a certain point, and I'm going to probably come back to this on another day more than I uh, might today, but at a certain point, they don't want to just do I'll be amazed what you can do with something like this in terms of creating tunes, even a turkey baster. That's for another day too. Just trying to intrigue you with some things that can come up. Um, but at any rate, uh, we got to get beyond that for our seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-olds. You know, they're not going to do that all day long. They might tolerate it in their younger siblings, but that's it. They might secretly inside want to play more with sound, but they need more. Okay. So what we tend to do, and it is um, very common to do it. It has all kinds, of, there's, there's quite a few resources with which to do it at times. We tend to move into what we sometimes call composer studies. And, and here's what I want to say about that. Um, I love biography. I love to read biography. I think adults are particularly drawn to biography, especially well-written ones or ones about people we're interested in or periods of time we're interested in. And there's a lot that can be learned and gained by biography. But biography alone doesn't get you very close to music. Um, it can illuminate, it can add, it can support. But the general thing with biography at these ages, especially when they're not able to take on truly probing biographies, which they can do later in high school and as young adults and as older adults, what you want to do really is pinpoint what is useful in biography. And I would really like to go back to that idea of pinpointing, pinpointing something that gets you directly to the music. Because what very often happens, and it's still valuable, don't get me wrong on this, but we tend to get very involved in the biographies of composers. And by the way, a lot of them are not things we want to spend too much time on. Artists' lives can be a mess, if you haven't noticed that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not always the prettiest story. That's a different talk. But we look for things that we think give us a picture, help us get a picture for our children about biography so that they come away knowing from birth to death what that composer did. But sometimes we do that at the expense of hearing, learning, and exploring music. And this is the idea of pinpoint. I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, the thing is with, with music, kids hear it, they remember it, they sing it inside, they sing it outside. They recognize it if it's on the radio or when they hear it in a film score or on a, a commercial. Um, those things are real to their ear, but we're cultivating that ear. Let me stop and say this, and those of you who know me, know I'm always going off on little rabbit trails, but let me say this. The digital age, for all the wonders that it gives us, and I know what they are and you know what they are, and as adults, I think we really can use and appreciate those wonders. We're using one now. But the fact is, getting music now means pushing a button. A two-year-old, a one-year-old, can push a button on an iPad, a, a, an iPhone, an iPod, if they still even use those, um, and come up with every piece of music Beethoven ever wrote. And I have a problem with that. I have two problems with that. One is music is supposed to be something that we produce and that we receive. That's the kind of music that we, we read about in the scriptures, you know, make a joyful noise, sing praises. And whatever the kind of music, whether it's um, Bill Monroe or whether it's Holly, the musicals from Broadway that we tend to love, whether it's gorgeous operas by Puccini, whether it's, uh, it, it really doesn't matter, whether it's our, those incredibly valuable children's songs that I referred to in our first session, uh, nursery rhymes, and every song in between, every stop of music in between, the most uh, intense and useful and fruitful and exciting way to experience music is to hear it and to receive it, and to make it, and to give it. Give, make, give, hear, receive. That's really the paradigm of music. And the problem with the digital music with little ones is they push a button and they've got everything. You know, all these toys. Yeah, good luck telling people not to bring them to you, especially if there's a baby shower. I'm sorry, I try to get rid of them as soon as possible. 
I don't want a toy where you touch a button and out comes Segovia or, you know, Louie Louie or anything. I, I don't want a touch of a button to teach a little child or a medium age child or even us that all we have to do for music is push a button. As adults, that's a different thing. So the digital situation, not even to mention the earbuds, where the sound, I don't care what kind of speaker, I know it can be fantastic, but it has nothing to do with received sound from live music made by real people, whatever opportunities you have. So I've said enough about that. I can preach about that for about four straight hours, and I won't do that to you today, okay? But the fact is, we don't learn a lot as little ones if everything we hear about music is coming into our ear. On the other hand, I'm going to tell you to listen to a recording of something. So there you go. Is that a contradiction? Well, we know there's a lot of contradictions when we get into the digital media, the electronic age, as we try to grapple with the right role. But I would encourage you to discourage as much as possible music where that little child is only hitting a button and sticking an earbud in, and that's it. In. I said end. It's hard for me to end a sermon. All right. Let me go back to this again, the idea of what children can hear. They hear form, which is repetition and contrast. And they hear style, which is how music changes. Over time, the style of music we like changes. The melody styles, the harmonies that we use, the rhythmic styles, the kinds of textures, whether there's one voice that we know from medieval period, whether church chant or the kinds of folk songs that we think of the troubadours, the trouvères, the minnesingers who would go along with their stringed instrument of some kind or maybe a flute or just their voices singing the ballads and epics of their period. That was monophonic, one line. To the thick sounds that people in the 19th century loved. And I've been going on and on and on and I haven't done something I need to do, which is, are there questions? And we're gonna let Paul, you're gonna be our question giver, okay? That that would be great. I don't see any up ahead, but I did I did have sort of a question comment regarding what you're talking about: make, give, hear, and receive. And this is uh, my child who is learning piano. We had somebody as a house guest, and that person said, "Play me a song." And as it started happening, of course, it was it was awkward, you know, and things like that. It wasn't perfect, but I had this sense that what was happening was something very old, very ancient. Does that make sense? Yes. And I thought you might say she or he refused um, because our kids are not growing up in a, in a time like as I did, where everybody seemed to play something, not necessarily well. And it's very hard in a world where the child who can play something is now the exception and then a bunch of adults look at him and say, play me something. It was a very different world when virtually not only everybody kind of played or really played, but it, that was what you did. You, you, you wanted to play the way people want to get on a scooter or um, what do you call these things? These, oh, these things, these hoverboard, is that what they're called? You know, we want to get our scooters out there and we want to get on them. And people used to want to scoot on their instruments and sing and know songs. And yes, it's very ancient. It's very important. And if you have a child, no matter what level, who wants to come in, I know it might be an interruption that you have guests and wants to sing you um, Itsy Bitsy Spider, please. Or, you know, the older kids are too shy. The older kids don't see the value. So what you're talking about there is critical. Um, and, and I see another question, which is overwhelming a problem. I, I, I wonder if that could be cleared up, Paul. Do you know more about what that was referring to? I think we lost Paul's. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was again, right? You got it. Yes. Okay. I I hit my mute button before and I forgot to unmute myself. Oh. My fault. It's a good thing um, you're in an orchestra. The conductor would have called you down. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something like you know. One time when I was learning an instrument, I heard just a master of that instrument, and and literally, I looked at it and said, oh, I don't, I'll never get to that. And I, you know, when you you're opening up and you're speaking about the ability to just turn on your your iPod or you know whatever device it is now, and you've got everything, you've had the whole composition, you have everything, it's already done. Sometimes there's an overwhelm overwhelmed sense when you do that. Say, 
where, how am I going to get from, you know, picking up this guitar that I don't even know uh, more than a chord to what I hear right there. So it's just an, a discouragement. It is again, because we're not surrounded by the process anymore. You know, if I look at, uh, I'd love to go back to sewing, which I did a little at school because we all had to do it. But then I look at what I want to make and I don't know how to get from A to B because I no longer am around uh, everybody sewing, everybody having machine, everybody stitching. Uh, we are away from that. And I think we have to remember that a first grader thinks a third grader sounds fabulous playing the whatever. And, and you know, when the kids were around, one of the great things about the old days of doing the recitals, even if you didn't stay with piano one or two years, you might have been in eight but you heard the nine-year-old and the 10-year-old who played better than you, but they were only nine and 10. They weren't Horowitz and Paderewski, you know, or Lang Lang. So you weren't as overwhelmed. And I think there was a lot of wisdom in the way teachers would present music. And you kind of all remember being maybe what grade, third grade and looking at the seventh graders. And people say, well, how am I going to get to all this music live? I can't. Who can afford to go with eight, eight people to the Houston Symphony or the Dallas Symphony or the Boston Symphony? And, of course, I want to say, look, the seventh grade band to a third grader is the coolest thing. Now, you and I may not want to hear the seventh grade band all the time. But when you're third grade and when you're seventh grade, the high school seniors are fabulous. And that's really what I want to encourage people to do. Make uh, take exam uh, advantage of these resources that are they may charge something or donation or they, it's usually going to be free. We forget that that, as you say, the digital incredible model does overwhelm in so many ways. You know, you kind of wonder if a baby sits there and looks at her, someone running and thinks, well, I'll never do that, you know. Um, but we're built to we're built to progress. I think you know God made us to progress step by step. And if there's enough models along the way, and if you had known somebody who was just in the fifth grade or whatever, two years ahead of you, who played a little bit better than you, you know, you might and not just the digital models that are perfect and altered, of course, engineered to sound perfect. By the way, human beings don't play perfectly. You know, it's, you might get a little of it perfect, but so if you had had something that was more um, just accessible you wouldn't have had that reaction is at least possibly you wouldn't have. And, and, you know, so you say, well, how do you learn all these repertoire, all this repertoire if you're not going to present the real thing, you present the real thing, but you want steps. And I'm going to actually go back to this idea of the composer study now, and maybe some of this will weave together. Um, I always try to weave things together. Uh, whether we get it together is another issue, but, if it, it's overwhelming, a biography is interesting, but it's also overwhelming. If you do Mozart's biography, even though he lived a short life, boy, what a packed life. Whereas if you take one thing, for example, I'll give this as an example. I mean, you could say he was a superb proud prodigy. There are lots of child prodigies at any point in time. Yes, his, his profile was pretty high, but he was by no means the only one. And I think that's important. If you don't believe that, get on YouTube technology and look up child prodigy from all over the world and prepare to be amazed. So this phenomenon of a fantastic prodigy is, is one of the things that we humans sometimes do, but let's crank forward in his life where he was interested in technology of his day. What technology? Well, two things for sure. What would go on in the opera theater? What were the newest possibilities with, cause we're still in the age of, you know, of, uh, without electricity and without all the motors running all the stage. So everything was done by hand, cranked. Somebody descended from the heavens in an opera or, you know, in a, or from the a Baroque opera on classical mytho mythological subject and Cupid comes down. It's going to be somebody cranking a, a um, handle in the back, letting that singer or actor down. So he was interested in the improvement of all these technologies that would make these stage performances more, you know, special effects, we call them today, except we do it differently today. Of course, he was interested in theaters and acoustics and how big the orchestra pit was and the budgets and all those things. Those are biographical factors we sometimes don't teach, but he was interested in instruments, the technology of instruments, which is evolving really through almost all time. Now it's with the exception of electrifying and digitalizing them. We're pretty static right now with, with most of our instruments, okay? But there was a time when the wind instruments were changing all the time, place to place, mouthpieces, reeds, tuning, links, pitches. And Mozart was interested in the clarinet, which was evolving out of an instrument um, that we 
too that you you see in museums and some people still pull them out refurbish them or actually reconstruct them and perform the repertoire that was formed it's called the basset clarinet and the basset horn like a basset like a dog a basset hound if you will b-a-s-s-e i think it's t-t i should know that but basset clarinet and the coming out of an instrument that was popular that broke the basset horn 18th century especially there was a new instrument coming, clarinet. It's not quite like ours. It's not pitched the same. It's going to look very similar. But he had a friend who was just, you know, crazy about that. And and for him, he wrote, therefore, clarinet pieces. He wrote for the clarinet. He incorporated it in some of his stage works. He, um, he wrote chamber music because he had someone he knew who was very good on this evolving and suddenly ear-catching instrument. Now we can go a little bit later and we can get to Haydn. And a lot of people, of course, love to do stuff. And Haydn has a fascinating career and an international career. And that's one of the most interesting things about him is that he had different, he had an Italian audience, a German audience, and an English audience. That's pretty international for the late 18th century. But Haydn had a friend, Anton Weidingen, who was interested in the things that were evolving with the trumpet. Now you go back, you go back to box time, and trumpets could play just specific notes, what we call harmonics, acoustics, overtone series, something you can get in with your older students. They can look at the overtone series and see which pitches. Find a trumpet player, find a trombone player, find a brass player who uses a mouthpiece, a brass mouthpiece. And what you'll do is you'll find out that that mouthpiece can come off. And those people who are good at this, or even not so good, can make all these pitches. You don't need the instrument. It won't sound the same. It sounds buzzing. They're buzzing their lips. But they can play the pieces, just the notes in those pieces, because those are the natural um, sort of sounds that come off of a sound wave of a fundamental pitch overtones. There's not time now to lay it all out. And you need to look at graphics a little bit. It's fascinating. If your kids love science, I don't want to play an instrument. Fine. Learn about acoustics. Figure out what's going on in the instruments. Okay, you know, that can usually work. But at any rate, what was beginning to happen is people were beginning to put valves or keys. And this had already started. It's not the first time. But people are beginning to experiment with holes in the bore of the instrument the way we have holes in, in recorders. And then, of course, we cover them with flutes. And then the flutes go from being like this to be going like that and all of this. In other words, all the technology, when we talk about our great composers, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven. The technology of instruments was just expanding so quickly. So Haydn and his friend worked together on a lot of things. And basically what would happen is exactly what would happen today when you went to somebody and said, hey, have you seen this new website platform? Hey, have you tried this? Hey, have you seen my, I, my iPhone that now does this? I mean, people get excited about technology and they got excited about the instruments. So now it's going to be possible to play notes, not just the octave and the fifth, and the fourth and certain intervals that come naturally out of a fundamental pitch, which is why when you take trumpets or fanfares, you get right. You know, those are, we think of that fanfare sound uh, on and on and on. Now we're going to be able to start playing the pitches in between and without even I mean, again, how this happens takes a little longer to show it. An instrumentalist can show you immediately. For me to talk about it takes six times longer, and that's not the best way to do it. Again, either, okay, you can possibly find YouTube videos that are very good. I know you can. Um, and we do a little bit of this in our early American, uh, our Exploring America's Musical Heritage, when we filmed at West Point. And I know, Paul, you know that program really well, um, where we had someone showing us the colonial trumpets the, the, without those vowels and then the vowels coming in and then the modern trumpet. But my point in all this is that Haydn's trumpet concerto, which is one of my favorite pieces and a great piece for kids the ages we're talking about, could not have been played on the earlier manifestations of trumpets because those trumpets couldn't play those notes, no matter how good the players, no matter how skilled, no matter how professional, because those notes weren't available. They're not part of the natural overtone series that comes out of a pitch that actually has other pitches embedded in it, colors in it that a, a, a player knows how to pull out based on the, the muscles, which we call the embouchure, and the capabilities of the mouthpiece. And that's brass play. Brass players, brass players are ama amazing. Get to know some if you don't know some. I'm serious. Go to the bands. Go to the win ensembles. Um, 
you know, we always get focus, focused on violin, et cetera, et cetera. And that's marvelous. And they can do it too, by the way, it's called harmonics. And they play those beautiful high sounds. They're coaxing out intervals that are in the basic sounds. But it's kind of fun for kids this age to hear it coming out of wind players, brass players, trumpets, things like that. So we have this wonderful piece and it, it also, Wrong key, boy. No trumpet player would play it, play it in that key. I can't actually remember which key it's in. I should know that. One should always know everything, right? Um, but the point is, great melody, and it keeps recurring and recurring and recurring. It's brilliant. And by the way, if I can add another thing in there, our Friday performance picks, which now we're up to about 160 of them, and they're free on our website. They come out every week. We pick a piece, an interesting piece. Um, an unusual piece, a piece played by kids, you, some of those prodigies sometimes, youth orchestras, very interesting venues played in a meadow somewhere where it's beautiful, all kinds of different things, all styles. Um, our very first one was this concerto, the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, if I'm not mistaken. And you can go back to that. Uh, it's all on our website or just find a recording of it. Um, but the, the marvelous thing about a piece like that is you hear that melody, um, who, I'll find out later today what key it's supposed to be in. You hear that melody, and every time it comes back with the orchestra or with the trumpet, what a child hears is form. The child is beginning to hear form, and there's different forms that use repetition and contrast. We'll have to get into that in a different session than today, because our time won't allow it. But repetition and contrast, you remember that, that um, point I made about the hymns, blessed assurance, and then this is my story. That's a simple two-part form. Many songs have a simple three-part form. Dances, whether they were the dances that George Washington, who was a great social dancer, would have danced, where they all the people in that ballroom or in that country mansion where they would have been having a rare moment of happiness, perhaps dancing. Um, those those dances had forms and they knew which steps went with which section of the dance. And again, classical music that we call not just classical, of course, all music has a form. Uh, there's many names for these forms. And one of the ways kids learn about music once they hit the ages of fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, is they begin to distinguish these forms and name them and hear them. And this idea of repetition of a, of a very prominent element like bum, 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 to help you define the section here and then the sections that are different. And then back comes bum, 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 bum. and then another section and then Bum, 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 bum. As each time you have a sense of traveling through the time, music takes time. It's a plastic art. It moves through time. It needs time to develop. You can't squish it into two seconds. Um, at any rate, you start hearing repetition and contrast, repetition and contrast. And a child can very easily hear it and very easily learn to name most of it. Um, it takes a little while. It takes exposure. Um, I'll, I'll name one more quick example. If you know this Mozart Rondo. And some of you have heard that. I mean, Rondo for repetition, contrast, repetition, contrast. I've said that a lot. But those kinds of learnings, and you know, you say, well, how am I going to do this? Well, you look up Mozart and Rondo and out you will come with all kinds of pieces because rondos were very popular. They were very popular in the um, actually beginning quite the idea of you go all the way back to medieval and found and find pieces that had returns. Uh, ritornello uh, could also be called if you use a different language version of it. It's the French rondo or Italian rondo. Rondos spelled differently in French. Ritornello, return. Um, so. All of this is out there. Composers, remember, they have five elements. They have melody, harmony, they have rhythm, they have the voices that they use of the instruments or human voices, and they have the idea of the different sound qualities, the trumpet versus the clarinet versus the flute versus the oboe versus the violin and the viola versus my voice versus your voice. And then they have form. 
And truly, it's I, I found it astonishing one day, I mean, long, long ago, when I really realized that all music had form. Um, John Lennon, you know, yes, I, oh, Paul McCarthy, sorry, yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Remember? Um, I can't believe I'm doing this. Boy, wouldn't you have liked to have written that piece? But you know what? There's a form to that song. There's a form, and it, you know, song form, and that tends to be returning uh, many songs over time, A, B, A, and many other variations on that. So I'll, I've talked about a lot of things, that is for certain, from this to talking about rondo form and development of instruments in the 18th century. I mean, that's a lot of different things. But the fact is, our kids um, are interested in learning. They tend to find in those many different things, they'll find something they're interested in. The instrument development. How do you make a trumpet anyway in 1796 when the Haydn was writing his late in his life, somewhat late in his life. He lived quite a long life. He has years to go, but he was writing the creation. He was mature and famous. You know. But how did somebody make a trumpet in those days? How did they make it in box time? How did they make it 100 years earlier? How do they make it now? Uh, I mean, that may be what interests your child. And you can learn, again, the technology can help us here. Great to go visit an instrument factory. Not everybody can do that. Uh, great to go to the junior high school or the fifth grade band or the eight or the high school band is sometimes, hey, those kids want to be cool, right? If you get the right kid, show people how they put these things together. Show them what goes on. Show them how a valve works. Show them what happens if they don't use the valves. This is the kind of thing that, that kids latch onto. And it makes them, ready, appreciate the music. It, they won't be overwhelmed by that kind of thing because it's pinpointed. They won't have an entire biography to deal with because something like a composer having a friend who's working with a newly evolving, technologically cutting edge instrument and therefore writing for that instrument, and boy, that happens over and over and over, that's not overwhelming. You can go deep into that. You can harvest a lot of music repertoire pieces, you might say, or songs, if you like to say that. You can build around that, and you can build around it as age appropriate, whether you're talking about a fifth grader or an eighth grader. You can send your kids in that age out to go find out to ask the questions. We'll come back to that in another session, because learning to ask questions about an art form is a big, important thing as well. So my hope is that all of these different topics I've been throwing out at you today, um, they are going to be topics that um, give you a, a pit point and something you can take. Uh, and truly, even if you don't like these, come up with something else. It's just like anything else we do. We find one thing that speaks to us and then we build on it. And eventually we have a body that helps us to appreciate that thing. What do you think, Paul? Did I hit enough topics? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm I'm taking notes, and um, I hope others are too. But yes, you you did, and and I like that though. Pick that one thing, and that's that's part of our job as parents to to sort of discover that, to communicate that fact. What are some suggestions you you have suggested uh, during the course of this? But but do you have a couple other suggestions on actually finding that? You, you mentioned uh, listening to certain things and, and going on and checking out your uh, your picks for the for the Friday, your Friday picks, performance yes. picks. Yeah, I mean, really, if somebody a couple had, other ideas. Yeah, I, I I shouldn't be talking over. I forget we're not in the same room. I wish oh, that was my problem. I wish we were visiting. I could go to your house and and sit with your family. We've had chances to visit with the Bass family, and they've just been amazing amazing moments in our lives. Uh, but what I would say too. Um, Actually, I had a wonderful thing to say, and then I talked myself out of it. Do y'all ever do that? No, no, it's just me. Um, Friday performance picks, that was it. Get on our emailing list, professorcarol.com, and they'll come to you every Friday. Now, you can find them on the website. They're all on the website, which is professorcarol.com, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-C-A-R-O-L.com, professorcarol.com. And they are there, and they are going to be right there on the, easy for you to see. I think they're on the front page all the time. You'll pick through them, and you can go back 160 times, I guess, you know, see something. I think in there, in 160, there'll be something you'll like. And we provide, um, we link to a very interesting performance that we're able to link to. And then we give you about three paragraphs of a take on it. 
um, basic information, maybe a couple of questions about it. Maybe it's not set up for, for like here, question one. It's not like that, but just something that might catch your attention, your child's attention. And even if all you do is go back through and pick 10 of those, you've got a lot of music to work with. And I think as a parent or let your, hey, assign that. Here's 160 of these. That's overwhelming. Go back and find me three you think are cool. Okay, here's 30 of these. Go back and see. Because the kids like to find their own stuff at this age. They don't really want you to show it to them. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, that, that is true. The, the discovery is, is very important in this case. And I will just give a testimony on my behalf. Is It has to do with the word loony. And that's how I rec you know, recognize these classic performances that I had no idea. Do you know what I'm talking about? Exactly where you're going, because we're doing it with our grandchildren now. You're talking about Bugs Bunny, aren't you? Yes, Looney Tunes. I tell you, when you go back and look at those, when I go back and look at those decades later, boy, were they clever. Those were all trained musicians who knew how to put, I mean, they, they could have turned around and done something else, but that was where the action was, creating that kind of film and those marvelous uh, scores and use of music and sound effects, which people made. You know what? People made those sounds, right. not um, technology, the human gifts of sound. And, you, and if you haven't watched one lately, whoa. And yes, we got really exposed to the classical repertoire in those days, absolutely. Amazing. And I, I bought a CD when I was in my probably mid thirties or so of, of the soundtrack essentially. And I would pop that in and literally I knew exactly which scenes I saw them again and I could hum and I could, you know, I could hum along these. And you know, I, the sad thing is I wish that I would have had professor Carol back then to be able to tie that together, to be able to say, oh, do you know what piece this is? You know, of course, Barber of Seville, that's like probably the only one where they like literally had a barber in it. But, you know, some of the other things, you know, it's just, oh, well, Elmer Fudd or whatever. But if somebody could have tied that all together, like a Professor Carroll, that would have been exciting. Well, and there was more um, connection than you might think to some of those scenes. And I bet you somebody's done some dissertations on it or books on it. We have to look for that, Paul. We got to go see if that's out there. Because sometimes if you ask the question, you find out someone, I always figure somebody is writing on that very topic or has. But it, it is, it just shows again that something like that at a certain age, whether the little ones or the power and, and we've gone over a little time, our time that I, I have to say on Tuesday night, I'll be uh, giving a pre-concert talk uh, at one of our local ensembles. So it's actually uh, the Dallas Winds, the most marvelous wind band in the United States. They really are a civilian wind band and they do fantastic concerts. Uh, and this one Tuesday night is all John Williams. And this will be about the fourth time they've done over maybe 10 years, John Williams night. And I mean, there's something, think of that, how that, and he's a brilliant composer, has changed. And what does he use? Those same elements to have swept all of us away with melody, harmony, rhythm, and texture, and timbre, and use of form, and painting the pictures that really have created our culture. So, and I know you love that, but that's a different session, isn't it, Paul? We better wrap this one up, or you and I will just start talking about movies, and I know where you go with film music. Yeah, I get, I get carried away. Yes. Okay, we won't do that today. We've probably thrown enough out. But we want to thank everyone for joining us. And we will uh, be continuing this series. We'll be putting out the dates. Um, also, it's going to be important for me to get down to a more of a fine focus and try to develop rather than tossing things to you in my, uh, in my hopes of getting this idea of pinpointing uh, within all of this uh, a little clearer and hopefully useful for you. Great. Thank you, Professor Carroll, and thank you, everybody. Cultivating beauty, getting started with music. Bye.